hello and welcome to MAT 103. My name is Tina Carter and I am the coordinator of this course for Buffalo State College. Um, I'm going to be making some videos this semester that hopefully will uh, help you to be able to um, learn the material deeply. MAT 103 is uh, an intellectual foundations course and that means it's a course that should benefit you uh, in your intellectual growth and in your in your life in general. So it must not be that this course is just a repeat of using the quadratic formula or factoring um, complex algebraic equations or solving them. It has to be much different than that in fact if it's going to be something that you will really use in moving forward. So what we're going to do is introduce some of the greatest ideas in mathematics. And they will not be easy for you to think about, but that's why we do this. We want to give you things that you have never heard of, never thought about before, and challenge you to be able to uh, think in that context. Some of the things are really hard to wrap your head around, like uh, the concept of infinite sets. But with these videos, you should have all you need in order to come to a deep understanding of the concepts in this course. And I guarantee you that if you put in enough work to do that, you will come away with a much deeper understanding of mathematics and hopefully an appreciation of it that many of you don't have at this point. So um, if you have questions please ask your instructors and I hope very much that you will enjoy this semester. Our authors give us uh, what they call lessons for life and <clears throat> these are lessons that they bring back to your attention over and over again in each section of the textbook. So let's just briefly look at them. You don't need to memorize this of course but keep them in mind uh, and you'll see them throughout the text because these ten things will allow you to become better thinkers. Number one, if you're faced with a problem and you look at it and you have no idea what to do, the first most important thing is to do something. Uh, take a first step. Write, draw pictures. Write down a, a table. Do anything to help yourself get a better picture of what you're being asked uh, to solve. Very importantly, number two, don't be afraid to make mistakes and fail. Uh, mistakes are our biggest teachers sometimes. In fact, I'm hoping that you will share the mistakes that you make with your fellow classmates and with your teachers because they help everyone come to a better understanding. Keep an open mind and explore the consequences of new ideas that you become acquainted with. Number five is very important in doing problems is seek the essential. Often we have problems that are cluttered with many, many, many words and that makes them seem all the more confusing to us. I know you guys call these things word problems. Well really all of the problems we'll ever have in life are word problems, aren't they? So we need to be able to find out what's essential in the words and, and use only that. I like to read a problem once and take out the essential and I don't have to go back to all those words. Uh, number six, of course, understand the issue. Number seven, understand simple things deeply. We'll help you to do that this semester. Very simple things like prime numbers, uh, counting. We will have you look at those concepts in a very deep way. Number eight, break a difficult problem into easier ones. This you will often find helpful. In fact, there's a problem in uh, chapter one that you may be assigned. Um, it has to do with several people shaking hands. I think there's maybe seven couples shaking hands. And, 
and it's very difficult to think about it. But uh, a hint is, break it down to three couples or two couples and see how easy it is in that case and you'll be able to generalize to the larger uh, set of people. Number nine, exam examine issues from several points of view. We'll do that today in this video in both problems that we look at. And number 10, look for patterns and similarities. This often helps you to generalize to a much larger question than the one that you were asked. The first question that we'll look at, it's called a mindscape in the book. Our authors prefer that to using the word problems. Whom do you trust? Let's read it quickly. Um, in fact, I, I think I'll skip reading all of the problem. You can put this on pause and read the question carefully yourself. But basically, it's about uh, Congresswoman Smith, who finds out that, that someone in her committee has leaked a scandal to the press. There are five people on the committee, and she calls a meeting. And here's what she says. Once they are assembled, Smith declared, As incredible as it sounds, I know that three of you always tell the truth. So now I'm asking all of you, who spilled the beans to the press? And then the five people on the committee give their statements. But there's one thing now, seek the essential. All of these words that you read when you read the first paragraph, there's only a few of them that are important. And so I want to uh, circle what they are. Three of you always tell the truth. And we can assume in this problem that that is true. There are three people who tell the truth and two that are liars. So now we go on and read what each of the five people say, knowing that three of them are telling the truth and two are lying. And the question asked to us, the question posed is, assuming that Congresswoman Smith's first declaration is true, in other words, three always tell the truth. Can you determine who spilled the beans? So um, there is you, you, you could just read very, very carefully and logically come to the conclusion. But what I usually do, especially when I'm first faced with a problem, is I try to organize uh, the information given to me, sometimes with pictures, sometimes with a table. In this case, it'll be a table. I'm going to... Uh, make a table with a row for each of the five people and um, and organize what exactly they said. And so here's the table that I made. Each of the people, each of the five people, say to Smith who did it in their opinion. And sometimes it's maybe among two who they say did it. But we're going to make our chart and check uh, which people were possibilities in each one of these five people's answers. So first, Schlock said it was either wind or pocket. So that's easy. We'll check wind and pocket. Then wind, outrage, shouted, neither Sly nor I leaked the scandal. So if neither wind nor Sly leaked the scandal, then it, he's saying that it was schlock, pocket, or greed. So we're making our check marks in, on the people who they named as possibilities. Pocket chimed in and said, both of you are lying. Well, if both Schlock and Wind were lying, then the only person that could have done it in Pocket's statement is Sly. Greed said, actually, I know that one of them is lying and the other is telling the truth. So Greed is saying that either Schlock is lying and Wind is telling the truth or vice versa. So if, if one of Schlock and Wind is telling the truth and the other is lying, then they have to disagree 
on that name. So we see here that they disagree on schlock. So greed is saying it may be schlock. In that case, uh, wind would be lying. Uh, and they disagree on wind. So according to greed, it could be wind. They agree on pocket. They disagree on greed. And they agree on sly. So they can't, one of them can't be lying and one telling the truth. That was kind of a tricky one to fill in. And now Sly, what does he say? Sly says, no greed, that is not true. Okay, so if that, if what greed said is not true, Sly is saying it's either Pocket or, well, actually himself. Now, if you look at this, you see that there is only one name who three of them agree on as far as having done it, and that is pocket. So since there are three telling the truth, uh, we know that the person who, who spilled the beans is pocket. Now I find it easier to use a table like that. Uh, it allows me to organize my thinking better. But when I looked in the solutions manual, there was a very nicely written uh, solution that required no such thing. And maybe this is more the way you think. So let's go through that one. It's based on the fact that we know there are three telling the truth and exactly two liars. So if you look at Pocket here, uh, Pocket in this statement says that both Schlock and Wind are lying. Well, if Schlock and Wind are lying, then they are the two liars. And that means that Pocket, Greed, and Sly are telling the truth. But that can't be true, because Greed and Sly contradict one another. So we know that one of Greed and Sly is a liar, and in fact, so is Pocket, because he said that the first two were liars. So let me take maybe a red here. And we know that Pocket is a liar, and one of these two is a liar, which tells us that Schlock and Wind are definitely both telling the truth, both truthful. Press replay and go through that argument again if you need to. Schlock and Wind are both truthful. Well, if Schlock and Wind were both truthful, you can quickly deduce that the person was Pocket. That's because Schlock said it was Wind or Pocket, and Wind said it wasn't him. So it had to be Pocket. They're both truthful. So again, there's different ways of thinking about this. Um, you have to just start doing something. For me, that something is usually drawing a picture or a table and trying to get rid of all the words that tend to be confusing if you read them over and over again. The second Mindscape that we're going to do on this video is the one called Tea Time. Um, again, I'd like you to put, put it on pause and read this problem yourselves. But Briefly, Carmilla Snobnosy is having tea or offering tea to her friend, Mr. Hogslopper. And she puts a teacup down and fills it with three ounces of tea. And she puts a creamer down that has three ounces of cream. He puts one ounce of cream into his teacup and stirs it, dilutes it. And then, for some reason, he takes one ounce out of his cup and pours it back into the creamer. So now the creamer is diluted. And the question asks us, uh, which is more diluted? Is the tea more diluted than the cream, or is the cream more diluted than the tea? The first time I read this problem, I thought, oh, uh, well, you're pouring back into the cream diluted tea. 
So I thought just logically uh, or in intuitively that the tea would be more diluted than the cream. But my intuition failed me. It's not true. And uh, fortunately, I didn't say that to my students because I took the time to draw a picture and, and try to really see what was happening. So let's do that now. So I'm going to just draw pictures. Um, you see I drew a teacup with three ounces of tea in it and a creamer with three ounces of cream in it. Now the first thing that happens is that he pours one ounce of the cream into the tea and stirs it. So now the teacup, excuse my not so great drawing, uh, now the teacup has four ounces in it and it's diluted three parts tea to one part cream. And the, the creamer has now two ounces of cream in it, pure cream. Then the man pours one ounce of this diluted tea back into the creamer. Okay, so in the last case we have, again, three ounces of diluted tea, three ounces diluted three to one, and we have the creamer back to three ounces of cream. And we're asking, what is the dilution there? That's the question. So you see how we're seeking the essential. We're trying to understand the question. Is the tea, is the cream as diluted as the tea, less, more, etc.? So uh, the first time I saw this problem, I didn't see the easy way to think about this. And so I'm going to show you the way that I thought about it. And actually, many of my students over the semesters have also thought through the problem in the following way. We'll look at it from two different perspectives. Let's draw a picture of what happened. I'm going to start by drawing this scenario right here after the first step and I want to try to show the dilution. So I'm going to take the teacup and just write it as you know, a square here and let's see we had one ounce of tea, two ounces of tea, three ounces of tea and one ounce of cream. So here I'll just draw lightly white and take that uh, pink again and make this whoops that didn't didn't work excuse me and so there's three ounces of tea and our creamer at this point has two ounces of cream in it two ounces of cream okay so now Imagine stirring that all up over on the left, the teacup, and pouring it back in. Well, okay, so in order to picture that, I'm going to, I know it's one-fourth cream, so I'm going to divide this into four. This doesn't look like equal parts there, but, and I'm going to say this is cream, 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 and this is tea. So I'm dividing it into smaller parts because I know that when I pour that diluted one ounce into the cream that it is diluted three to one tea. So let's take this right here and pour it into the creamer. Well then I need this also divided up into uh, fourths. So I can say, okay, this was cream, 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 cream. We had all parts cream. And now we pour into this uh, tea, 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 cream. This is one ounce diluted three to one. And now we can answer our question. This part here is gone. And now we can look and answer our question. We see over here that we have nine parts of tea to three creams. 9 to 3, tea to cream, and over here, 
what do you know? We have nine creams to three teas. And so the dilution is the same. The dilution is the same. Now here's the answer that was in the uh, answers in the, in the solutions manual. It's very simple, but often you don't see it until you've worked it out in a more complicated, tedious way. We started out with a teacup with three ounces in it and a creamer with three ounces of cream. We ended up with three ounces of dilution, three ounces of dilution. So whatever amount of tea is, whatever amount of cream, I mean, that is over here in the teacup has been replaced by exactly, it has to be the same amount of tea in the cream. None of it's gone anywhere. We had six ounces to begin with. We've got six ounces now, three in each container. So whatever amount of cream is over there in the tea, it has to be exactly the same amount of tea that's in the cream. And so if you write up, you know, two or three sentences to that effect, you've solved the problem. Speaking of writing up, you should be able to write your answers using sentences, uh, of course, also mathematical notation where it applies, but it should be written up in a way that if someone else reads it, they know and understand the logic that you use to solve the problem.